body, again, is the slave to the mind. Don't make your body the master to your the master and slave right. the slaves. So it's important for that reason too. Nah, I think that's 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 powerful. I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of like big people, right? Obesity is very high in this country. I just yeah. seen that they now add an obesity in New York as a protective class of people. Uh, which is very interesting. I think nobody should bully ob obese people, and I think nobody should shame obese people in the sense to where it becomes bullying. Um, but at the same time, obesity is an illness. Yep. Um, and at the same time, like I said, nobody should discriminate against someone who's obese, like, you know, applicants on a, a rent application for, yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. housing or whatever it may be. But this idea that we have this shameless society right where the advocation for health ain't the highest right yes. instead it says that no you know just enjoy your body image the way yeah. that it is right yeah. but you know america is very sick right america is like listed 32 or and when it comes to out of the countries of high life expectancy no right our average is so currently around 78 years old right yeah. and we know that that is even less for men because men are under more stress which decreases your life expectancy indeed right so when we talking about when we look at america when you look at the history of america first of all you know i know you you're a big advocate of thought when it comes to you know we used to be farmers right yeah now we go to grocery stores right there was a time early in this country period where people would have to everything was local yeah right everything that you ate was local so it was you know indigenous to the landscape that you are in right yep. so you can only eat food in that area and then of course the railroad comes about and now food can travel yeah right so now you're getting cuisines and different dishes and now food is traveling from one place to the next but they also didn't know how to properly store food right yep. so now you just had to decide whether you think that this food was good or not by looking at it. <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, and so this is why you get things where you had, uh, uh, I believe it was, was it Kellogg's? I think it was Kellogg's. Was it Kellogg's? The one that lobbied, you know, um, to get the FDA to start regulating food. Now, they did it because they felt like they would have an advantage. Yeah. Or no, I think it was Heinz. I believe it was Heinz that did it because they were the first ones to be able to distribute food all throughout America. Like yeah. people don't think about the food mafias in America. We look at the Chase Morgan banks and all of the other cartels of families, but it's the food industrialists that was able to change the world, yeah. right? And this is one of the biggest industries on the planet Earth, right? Because yeah. everybody eats every day, 100%. right? And a lot of things that would transform and things that we do today are completely just based on capitalists and entrepreneurs. It has nothing to do with health whatsoever. Right. To the American standard diet has nothing to do with health. Right. Right. Even down to cereal. Cereal is actually a, a, a dessert, if you will. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It started off from granola treatments of patients that were sold to, uh, made by Kellogg's, and he told that to his patients as like a, a cure all for mental illnesses. Yeah. And then his brother was like, bro, we can sell this to the world, yeah. right? And he was like, no, I'm not going to sell this to the world. This is for my patients. But his brother understood that the average American was so busy and making breakfast was a task because yeah. they had to put all these ingredients together to try to figure out how to make breakfast in time. So it would take like two hours. Yeah. So when they was able to package cigarettes, I mean, not cigarettes, but they did that too. <laughs> when they was able to package uh, cereal, Right. Then they was able to now create a quick and easy breakfast alternative. And then they paired it with milk. Right. And now people started eating it. Right. Yeah. And at first, the first one that came out was like called grape nuts because they use grapes as a flavoring. And then Kellogg's came out by accident. You know what I'm saying? Because it was left out overnight and they put it through the machine and it came out in these little flakes. Yep. And he figured he can have a competitive advantage. You know what I mean? Over the rest. So I say that because... We do a lot of things that are inherent now and that are traditions now, but we never look at the history of how they were started. Right. It has nothing to do with your health and that these companies were able to claim anything that they want to. I'm talking about they was claiming that it, it healed, you know, mental illnesses yeah. and it healed cancer. Like these were the claims they was able to put over food. And to this day, I believe those claims are still somewhat inherent in the way that people eat food and think of it as like a wonder. Yeah. Like, oh, this is this. I need this breakfast because it's healthy for me. But it's it's a lie. Yeah. And you so 
I'm glad you brought that up because people don't understand how food has been industrialized. Mm -hmm. And when I say industrialized, it went from this whole natural, um, you know, phenomenon of everything I eat is whole foods, to, not the whole foods that we know today, right. to what we know it as today when you walk into a grocery store, 90% of the food in the grocery store is in a box bag can with a label on it. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that process actually began with the military mm. and how that how that began because in world war one what they discovered and learned from it was that one of the number one ways that a lot of the soldiers were dying was from famine mm. not being able to get enough food and so what they did was they they put together all these scientists and they wanted to come up with a lot of foods that could be able to last long on the the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And so this is where you see the first what's called C rations, which we know today as MREs mm. or processed foods. And then what happened was after they saw the success of that in World War II, they then took the knowledge and the technology and then gave that to the actual food industry. Mm -hmm. And this is when you see this boom in the food industry in the 1950s, 60s and 70s. And you see all of these products like Crisco saying, hey, you don't have to use this. You can use this. You don't have to be a wife that has to cook all day. We can cook a meal in 10 minutes. Right. And so you start to see the microwave come into play. Again, another technology from the military. Mm. And I learned this when I was living in Japan because while I was out there working at a hospital and being around a lot of the uh, military, I was able to go to one of the military libraries and do a lot of research. And what I discovered was most of the... Most of the products and food companies that are developed today, they develop when the technology was given to the food industry. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the only downside to that is the unfortunate thing for a lot of our military brothers and sisters. They know that when you join the military, you are the property of the United States. Mm. So if anything happens to you, if you die from anything, like you can't sue the United States right. because you are the property mm. of the United States. So none of this stuff was tested. None of us had an understanding of what this new food was going to do to the population. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing it here 50, 60 years later as an understanding of now it's been this whole test. Right. You know, and the unfortunate thing is there's about 10,000 food chemicals that are allowed in the food and the American food supply that isn't allowed in other countries. I recently did a video well, I was explaining to people U.S. foods that are banned in other countries. Mm. So you got Gatorade and Mountain Dew wow. banned in other countries because it has BVO in it, which is brominated vegetable oil, and dyes. You have things like uh, maraschino cherries, which is the cherry you see on top of the, the banana split of the sun, mm. uh, Sunday. Banned in other countries. Why country is that banned? The cherry. Because it has that red, uh, red number 40 dye in it. Okay, yeah. And that's been associated with a lot of uh, bladder cancer, thyroid cancer, kidney cancer, and also allergies. Mm -hmm. Okay, U.S. pork. And I'm sure you guys are like, you shouldn't yeah. have been eating it in the first place. But U.S. pork. <laughs> y'all say y'all love Malcolm. <laughs> y'all say y'all love Malcolm, but can't put that bacon down. Yeah, but it's banned in 160 countries mm. because they put um, this this chemical in it called ractopamine in the animal feed. It makes mm. the pig grow bigger. Mm. But it's, it's dangerous for the heart, it's dangerous for the nervous system, banned in 160 corn, countries. U.S. corn, banned in 140 countries because they spray, spray it with atrazine. Right. Atrazine is a pesticide that they did test on it and they discovered that if you use the right amount, you can convert a male frog into a female yes. frog. Meaning not make them gay, Literally, gender change, gender change bending the chemicals. Gender. And if you look at what's allowed in the water supply, it's mm -hmm. about 3,000 times the, the normal limit that was used to convert that frog into yes. a female frog. And, and, and yeah, Dr. Wesley did a great study about that, you know, when he was giving a breakdown. And, and they're in some water supplies. You know what I mean? You, you really want to do your research and check your local city, yeah. check, check Atlanta. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Indeed, indeed. Other foods like farm raised fish. <laughs> he laughed. <laughs> <I'm serious. laughs> oh my God. Listen, the water, listen, water, it, you know, our bodies, our skin is our largest organ. So indeed. we absorb things, right? Yep. So when we take a shower and you just soak it in a bath, that bath is full of chemicals. You yeah, don't indeed. think about it because you can't see it. 
right? So they're not detectable by your senses, your eyes. You don't feel it. But, you know, that stuff get clogged up on you the same way when we drink out of bottles, there's plastics that gets into our bloodstream. Yep. Right. So there's a lot of things that we're getting poisoned all the time. And then we go out there and talk about let's go race for cancer. But it's like our lifestyles are cancerous. Yes. Yeah. And then the unfortunate thing is, you know, like when you look at where cancer was in the 1970s, when um, uh, Richard Nixon claimed a war on cancer and you look at where we are today, we're worse. Mm-hmm. And they've thrown over $300 billion into the, the war against cancer, but nothing's... The only thing that has helped cancer in the 1990s was the fact that... You remember, like, all the rappers used to smoke Newports. Mm. It used to be a cool thing to smoke cigarettes. Mm. But they did a campaign where they just essentially urged people to stop, and people stopped smoking cigarettes. That's what's helped the cancer. Right. It hasn't been chemo. It hasn't been... Radiation, it hasn't been surgery because those are the same three modalities that they used in the 1970s. Right. So it's important that we know and understand that the same way they have industrialized our food and now our foods is, is filled with chemicals. It's like that with everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's flame retardants in mattresses that cause us to breathe those in. We get toxic from that. There's flame, there's all type of toxins in the air. There's toxins in the water. And so because we don't understand how to get these toxins out of the body, what things to eat, what things to do, how do we stimulate our lymphatic system, we are always going toward that modern medicine modality that truly doesn't get us the the ability to fight cancer that we we need to. Because everybody in this room at some point has had a cancer cell in their body. Mm -hmm. Everybody. But we don't know that because our immune system is constantly stumping it out without us knowing it. Right. And so it's important for us to know, even when you take chemo, the thing that saves you is your immune system, mm. you know, because chemo, again, another military invention. Uh, chemo is, uh, uh, is something that, you know, it doesn't just kill the cancerous cells. Right, it kills, kills all the healthy cells. cells too. This yeah. is why you're losing your hair. This is why you can't eat properly anymore. This is why your skin turns another color. Is it it's true that everything. people die because of the chemo? Yeah, absolutely. Not the cancer. Yeah. It's the chemo treatment that they have to survive. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? And when you think about something like that, it's like you think about the amount of people that were diagnosed that, you know, if they try something alternative, they may have survived because the rate of dying from chemo, I'm sure, is very high. Like, yeah. it's, I don't know what the percentage is, but I, you, you have a 50-50 chance. You either survive or you don't. Yeah. You understand me? And so most people go in there thinking death. Right. Yeah. Hospitals are designed like morgues. I talked about this with the brother Yaki is like when you go to a hospital, you, it's not you don't you're not in an environment that you think is about to save your life. Right. It looks just like a morgue does. Yep. Right. There is no life. There is no color. There's no vibrancy, no plants, no sound healing going on. Ain't no yeah. sage being lit. None of that stuff. It feels like, oh, I'm about to go in here on my deathbed, yep. literally. Yep. You know what I'm saying? A hospital bed is the equivalent to a deathbed because more people go into hospital and die, right? Yeah. So, you, you, like, during the C-19 situation, people that was put on the respirators, they had a, a very high chance of not getting off those respirators. Yeah. So it was better to, you know, allow, to, to, to practice, you know, open air therapy and sunlight and whatever other remedies that you could at home versus going into a hospital, which decreases your chance of surviving. Yeah, and the thing is, now we can look back what 2020 hindsight, mm-hmm. and one of the things that they discovered was that if you had a deficiency in vitamin D, Mm -hmm. it increased your your rate exponentially for having a severe response to C-19. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the African-American population, 80% of us are deficient in vitamin C. And the reason why that's so important is is this. With some people, the reason why our skin is like this is because of the adaptation to the sun. Mm -hmm. And so when we move from the equator the Caribbean, when we move from Africa, we remove ourselves from that year-round sun. Right. And so anybody that lives above the latitude of Atlanta, you're going to need extra sun, especially if you have melanin, because the thing about melanin, it reflects the sunlight. Mm-hmm. And so as a, as a person of color, as a black person, you're going to need even more sunlight because that's who we are. And so when you start to think about it, why we were so impacted by C-19, it was because... 
A, we, had, we have deficiencies in vitamin D. And a lot of times, I'll see people who come in and they have a vitamin D level of 8. Mm. Now, that's supposed to be at least 50. Now, they say the sort of the therapeutic level is above 25. But if you look at lifeguards who spent a lot of time outside, like we did back in the days, mm -hmm. because most of the work that we did was manual labor, and most right. of it was outside. If you look at a lifeguard's, you know, vitamin D level, it's like 100, brother. Mm. So that's what our, our, our sort of vitamin right. D level should be. High energy. Yeah, so it's, it's really about realigning ourselves back with nature and who we are. Mm -hmm. Because we're so far away from that in the natural sense of things because of the conveniences. I mean, we leave home, we get it directly into a car. Right. We drive into a parking lot. Right. We walk from a yeah. parking lot into a building. Most of our life, we're we avoiding the sun. Avoiding the sun. 